I too am grateful um, as I as I think about <clears throat> I'm I'm with Chad. Where where do we stop when do you when you start? And that's what we're going to talk about today is to be abounding in thanksgiving. So if you want to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter two, uh, we just went through this uh, as a church through the whole book of Colossians. But there are, there are two verses that that the Lord has just I don't know. Do you, do you ever have this happen? These are not my favorite verses, but He has just hammered this into my head um, ever since I, I went through this. And, and we looked at a bigger chunk of Scripture altogether when we went through the book of Colossians. But these two little verses, I just, I just haven't been able to, to get them out of my head and out of my heart. And, and uh, as, I, as I think about, Wendy and I, this morning, um, we were in the kitchen drinking coffee and, and she was making some stuffing for today. And I was in the way, and which is what I usually do in the kitchen. But anyway, we were we were talking, and and uh, we're just talking about <clears throat> sometimes uh, the fact that we, you know, the culture that we live in. It it just seems like it seems like people aren't as polite. It seems like for, not not always. And and I got to say, I I love West Texas and Eastern New Mexico because some of the kindest, nicest people that I've ever been around in my life. Um, not to say anything bad about the rest of Texas, but when Kyra was little, we had her in the hospital in Clovis and then Lubbock, and then we had to send her to Houston. And the nurses and the doctors and the staff and everybody was so nice in Clovis and so nice in Lubbock. And we got to Houston, and they were so in a hurry and such a big deal, and everything was all, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we're like, can we go back to Lubbock? We, we liked it better there. But, but one of the things I think that we're seeing happen in our culture, and I think we see this a little bit more every year, is, is we see this attitude of entitlement. This, this attitude that the world owes me something, this attitude that, that everywhere I go, I need to be treated perfectly. Everything has got to be right. Uh, and if anything goes wrong, it's everybody else's fault except mine. And, you know, grateful people are not that way. Grateful people are polite and courteous. They're thankful kind of people. And, and of all the things that, that we as Christians ought to be, we ought to be thankful. Uh, I am so grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want you just to think about it this morning. The reason that we're here. Now, I know the food's going to be awesome, and thank you so much for everybody who's prepared something today. And I promise you, I, I won't, I, I didn't even wear my watch today so that, you know, we'll just make sure that we get to the food. And I'm grateful for the fellowship of this church. I love every single one of you. I love your families. I love your kids. I love your extended family. I, I, I'm so grateful. I, I thank God every day as I think about this church and the ministry that God's given us here. And I, I just, I'm, I'm so grateful. And I am so grateful for my family. My wife is the best wife in the entire world. And I know you all all have one of those two. And I'm glad for that. But as far as I'm concerned, she is an incredible gift to me. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and receives honor from the Lord. And that just, that just every time I think about that verse, it blows me away. God honored me with my wife. And I am so grateful for my kids. And some of them, we had a challenge getting into this world, two of them at least, uh, with health issues and I'm so grateful, and I'm so grateful that Kyra is fixing to get married, and at the same time, please don't. <laughs> she's, she's packing up the house right now, and, and I'm like, let's not do this, you know? Are you sure? I ask her, are you sure you want to do this? Do you really want to? I tried to bribe her with a Mossberg shotgun the other day. It didn't work, Michael. <laughs> I think I could bribe Michael with a shotgun. Maybe take more than a Mossberg, but I think I might could. But Kyra, she's a no-go, so. And I'm, I'm just teasing. I'm really great. I'm grateful for Spencer. You know, talk about a, an awesome deal to be a daddy and to know that you're going to give your daughter away to a godly young man and uh, who comes from a good family and Christian parents. And, and I'm still scared to death, and I don't want you to go, but... But I'm so grateful. What a kid. What a girl. What a young lady. Just incredible. To Maybe I get this over with now, so I don't have to do this in two weeks. But <laughs> to watch 
to watch a, a little old kid grow up. And all of y'all that have those little babies right now, y'all just, y'all just enjoy it because tomorrow they're going to be this big and they're going to leave. And then you're going to wonder if they're ever going to come see you again. You better be nice to them. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just, I'm just so grateful for all of my kids. I, I got my second one off at college now. And, you know, we, we kind of we kind of pout sometimes. We're like, the boy hasn't come home yet. He's come home one time. What's the deal? And then at the same time, I have to remind his mom, well, aren't you glad you don't have to throw him out the door and make him go? I mean, he's, he's doing what he's supposed to do, you know, go do your thing and come visit us again. But he's doing well, and I think he's going to pass, and so I'm grateful for that. And, and, and Katie Grace, she just gets taller every single day, and and she's so smart and learned how to drive, and, and she is, she's a great driver. She's smart and, and safe, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I can't wait till she gets some wheels and she can go pick up stuff for me, you know. And, <laughs> and JoJo, she's the same way. She's getting bigger and taller and smarter and stronger, and, and, and Julia, and they just have such a kind heart, and, and it just, it's just amazing. I mean... I mean, I, I, would, I never dreamed that God could bless you so much as you, you have this incredible blessing of these, these kids and, and, and then the family begins to expand and, and all of this and everything changes, but it's okay because, because God's in control. And I get, you know how much of all of that, I mean, this church, my wife, my kids, my family, my mom and dad, what an incredible blessing are my parents, Wendy's mom and dad. Uh, my sister, her brother, their families. What an incredible blessing. I mean, we, we, were just, we were just blown away. And I did nothing to deserve or to produce any of that. I mean, it's all a gift from God. And that's what the Bible says in the book of James. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights. The things that we have, we have received. And i got to tell you today, as I preach this message, I feel sorry for the atheist and the agnostic because this is a worthless day for them. And I know today's not the day, but for us it's the day. It's a worthless day because they don't have anybody to thank. The only people they have to thank are other people. But who do you thank for the life that you have and for the breath that you breathe? I get up every morning and I thank God that, that I, hey, I got another day to, to live in, in the blessing that God has given to me. And I didn't earn it and I don't deserve it. And so let's take a look. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As, so we start out this. This is a, a, a comparison, a, a simile using like or as, right? So, so we're going to compare two things. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk ye in him. So what we're doing is, is we're comparing justification and sanctification. We're comparing salvation with spiritual growth. We're comparing something that happened an instantaneous instant in time, the new birth, with something that will take the rest of your life until Jesus comes to get you or until you go to sleep and you go to be with him. And that is this this growth process in Christ. We're going to compare these two things together. And, and what he says is, is he says, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So the first thing we're going to talk about this morning as far as abounding in thanksgiving is, number one, growing in Christ. The only way that you can grow in Christ is to be in Christ. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So you've got to have a relationship with Christ. That's where this whole thing starts with. You want to be a grateful person, get saved. It'll make you grateful. Don't you love that song? For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you've promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. That should be your Christian experience. Every day, in every way, in everything, and for all things, that's what you should be like. And so, so as we think about this, John chapter 1, if you want to turn there in your Bible real quick, John chapter 1 and verse 12, fantastic passage of Scripture. He says there, but as many as received 
Him. That's the same thing it says in Colossians. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. This is where the Christian life begins, with receiving Jesus Christ. This has to be your experience. You've got to have a moment in time where you were born again. As I talked about all of my kids this morning, each one of them started. There was a moment in time, a conception, when they began. Yesterday they weren't. Today they were. And it's the same with your spiritual birth. There's got to be a moment in time when you receive Christ. It's got to be something you do. Your mom and daddy can't do it for you. Nobody can do it for you. It's got to be yours. You've got to come to a place where you hear the good news of Jesus and say, I'm a sinner and on my own I'm headed for hell, but I believe that God sent his son to die for me and I, wanna, I want him in my life. And I believe on Jesus and that's how you receive Christ. You believe on his name. And the Bible says that when that happens, that you are born again. Okay, so as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Well, you received him by hearing the good news and by believing in your heart. And so that's exactly how you grow in Christ. You hear his word and you believe it. And then you put it into practice. And the, and the Bible uses this really neat word to talk about spiritual growth. It says, so walk ye in him. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Isn't it fun? I was talking to Jason. Uh, Jason too, Thomas. He's, he's under the weather as well. So we need to remember these, these boys that are struggling. Jason loves you so much, he came by this morning and brought you some ham, even though uh, he and Amanda aren't coming because they got a sick little one. So I was visiting with Jason beforehand, and, and <laughs> we, were, we were talking about Thomas, and he said, man, we were talking about him growing up, you know, because that's what happens. And y'all all get to see me cry, but you're going to cry too, because they're all going to grow up one of these days. Just wait. Somebody said, hey man, it's going to happen to you. Rosin, he's going to be this tall, and he's going to be gone in like two days, Ian, so just enjoy it, but it's going to happen. He'll be coming in and be going, Dad, I need some money, some rodeo money, some gas money. <laughs> You'll be teasing about your bringing the grand, grandkids to see you. You'll be teasing about paying money for rodeo. Anyway, so, so what he said was, was so interesting. He said, you know, Thomas, he's growing. He said he's starting to walk. He said he can crawl up on the couch, but he's walking backwards. So we'll put, hold her hands up, we're like, come here, Thomas, and he starts walking backwards. You know, isn't it amazing? That's what we, we sit here and we watch these little ones, and this is such a, a, a mark, a big milestone in their life is when they start learning to walk, right? Well, I want to just show you what the Bible says about walking. I didn't even list them all, but these are all from the New Testament. But when the Bible uses this word walk, this is putting into practice what God has taught us in His Word through His Spirit by faith, okay? And so, so what He wants for us to do is take His Word in and then walk it out in life. So I listed all these for you in your bulletin. We're not going to turn to all of them. I'm just going to list them as we go through. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. What does it look like? As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. What does it look like to walk in Christ? Well, Romans 6, 4 says to walk in newness of life. As you receive Christ, this is new. Christ is new. The old life is a dead life. The old life is a, is a life that ends in death. The new life that Jesus brings is a life that, that leads, starts with and leads to eternal life that lasts forever. And so the Bible says walk in newness of life. That's what God wants for us. Romans 13, 13 says walk honestly april 15th walk honestly when you take your test at school walk honestly this is what god wants from you when you deal in business practices walk honestly when you deal with your spouse walk honestly second corinthians 5 7 says walk by faith can you see when we receive Christ, we receive Him by faith. So how do we live out this Christian life? We also live it out by faith. 
Uh, Galatians 5.16 and verse 25 say to walk in the Spirit. You say, gosh, that kind of sounds mysterious. What does it mean? Well, as you put all of these together, you begin to understand that, that all of these are little nuances of the same thing. It's this, this spiritual growth. So when you walk by faith, you walk in the Spirit, you walk in a newness of life, you walk in honesty. Ephesians 2.10 says, walk in the good works that God has before ordained for you to, to walk in them. Walk out good works. You say, gosh, I don't understand what that means. Sure you do. It means live a life of good works. When? Which ones? All of them, every time. Amen? <laughs> just, just, just make it good as you walk out this life. Ephesians 5.8 says, walk as children of light, as opposed to those who walk in darkness. You're in the light, so walk as children of light. Philippians 3, 17 and 18 tell us to walk as the apostles walked and not as the enemies of the cross walk. And so there are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. You shouldn't walk or live your life the way they do. Instead, you should emulate the life of the apostles and follow their example. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12 says, Walk a walk that is worthy of God. You are now a child of God, therefore represent God as you live your life. First Thessalonians, I'm sorry, uh, 1 John 2, 6, walk in the light. 2 John 1, 6, walk in love. And 3 John 1, 4, walk in truth. Now what a list. What a, what a, a lofty goal, amen? I mean, you, you just take that honesty, truth, and love, light, and life, and, and, and all of these things that we've looked at. That's what God wants for us. You say, well, <clears throat> how do I know when I'm there? Well, it's simple. You'll be in the presence of Jesus. In other words, you ain't there until he comes to get you. You don't ever stop growing. You, you, when, from the moment that you get saved, you begin a life of growth. And you should continue to walk in that kind of growth for the rest of your life. Amen? So, we live a life that is growing in Christ. Now, by the way, when you think about all those things, and you stop and you consider that, you just have to thank Jesus. Because the only way that you can walk in any of those things is because of the free gift of salvation that He has given to each and every one of us. Number two. We need to be grounded in Christ. Look at verse 7. He says, Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught. Rooted and built up. To be grounded in Christ, He gives us two metaphors. I love this because we started out with a simile. That's a comparison. And now we have two metaphors. These metaphors are, first of all, an agricultural metaphor. Rooted. How many of you know what an Afghan pine is? Anybody know what an Afghan pine is? You know what the problem with an Afghan pine is? Very shallow root system. Do you know what the federal government did with Afghan pines for years and years and years? They had this wonderful program that they would help you plant windbreaks with Afghan pines. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. You want to know why I know this? Because uh, I, I've seen rows and rows and rows of up in Grady where we used to live. If the wind's not blowing, something is wrong. You're, you're not there. You're in a different place. You know, I mean, it, 265 wind days out of the year or, or more, something like that. Anyway, everywhere you go, almost every house on the west side has two rows of Afghan pines planted. Anybody, Johnny, am I lying? All of that country, right? Well, so my dad, he, he, they, they get in on this, but he's not part of the government program. He just does it at his house. They planted some Afghan pines out there in front of his house, and he was around the west side of the house. Wind blows a lot at mom and dad's, too. Come by there one day, and wind blows one of these trees over. Well, you know, they start out little scrubby things. They grow pretty fast. Next thing you know, it's a big old pine tree, right? <laughs> it blows one of them down. And I said, well, that don't work very good for a windbreak. He said, no kidding. I'm bulldozing the rest of them before they tear the house down, right? So, so what, what is it that you do want? What's the tree that is used as a metaphor for strength? An oak, right? Don't you love to drive through the live oak country down south of, of here and west of us, or east of us and south of us? I, I just love it. Those live oaks. There's a place that, that uh, someday in heaven maybe I'll have. Uh, when you make the corner headed to Menard, there's a ranch there, and they've cleared all the brush and left all the live oaks. And it is so pretty. 
and they've got Hereford cows out there, and they're out there chewing their cud, and it just, every time I drive past there, I deal with covetousness, you know, I'm like, oh, I want that place, it's just beautiful, but those old live oaks, man, they are so strong, they are so stout, by the way, if you're gonna, if you're in a car accident, you're gonna have an accident with a tree, or a skiing accident, and you have a choice, there's an oak, or there's an Afghan pine, hit the pine, okay, hit the pine, you got a better chance of knocking that thing out of the ground, the oak will kill you dead, why? Because the root structure is the incredible root structure. What about a mesquite? Tap root. Down into the ground. Super strong root system, right? The Bible says that we need to be rooted like an oak tree in Christ. Rooted in Him. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. If you want to turn back a few books in your Bible. Ephesians 3. <clears throat> And verse 17, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. To be rooted and grounded in love. So what you've got is, is you've got this life of this walk, where you are walking in the things that you learn of Christ. And you've got this life that you are rooted in Christ. One of the, the, the things that always breaks my heart every time I study it, Every time I look at it are the cults and how successful the cults are and where they gain their followers. Did you know that the, one of the most favorite groups for Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons to prey upon are marginal Baptists? Marginal Baptists. Because they know just enough about the Bible to sort of have some of those words down. And the cult comes in with a different definition of every one of those words, and they just <laughs> suck them in. They're like an Afghan pine. They've got some roots, but they don't go down very deep. They're not very strong. They don't, they're not holding on to what they believe. They're easily swayed. They're easily moved. Take a look with me at Luke chapter 8. Jesus gives a, a parable of the, of the soils there. Uh, and in Luke chapter 8, it's the key to understanding all the parables. And he says in verse 13, you know, he tells us, that, you know, the sower went forth to sow, he sows the word of God. Some of it falls by the wayside. Some of it falls on the, on the road. Some of it falls in the, amongst the rocks. Some of it falls amongst the thorns. But some of it falls on good ground, right? Well, this is what he says about the rocky soil. Verse 13, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but being a pastor as long as I have, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Seen it happen. They, they get all excited about Jesus, and then all of a sudden life doesn't turn out the way that they want it to. They get upset with Jesus, and the next thing you know, you can't find them. And you realize that there was no root. They were not rooted and grounded in Christ. They were not rooted and grounded in love. The second metaphor is to be built up, an architectural metaphor. So you need these roots to go down. By the way, this is part of my job is helping you develop a root system. That's, that's what God has called me to do. It's my job to challenge you with the word, to encourage you to read the Bible, to point you in the direction to where where we can dig into doctrinal issues so that you develop a lifelong understanding of the Word of God, that's part of my job, like a coach. I'm kind of like a coach in that regard, uh, a life coach, if you will. I really don't like that term, but whatever. Um, but let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 right quick. An architectural metaphor. Not only do we need to be rooted in Christ, but we need to be built up in Christ. Now, can you hear the architecture of the building of a building? All right. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and in verse 10, we read, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, in any good building, you must start with a good foundation. And that's the foundation. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. There's the foundation. You've got to start with Christ. You've got to start with the gospel. You've got to start with being saved. Now, once that foundation is laid, unfortunately, a lot of lives 
don't do much with it after that. And that's one of the greatest tragedies in all of the church. Because once that foundation is laid, what God wants then is for you to begin building this life on that foundation. This is the life you're walking in. This is that life of truth and love and light and honesty and grace and all of those things that we looked at, right? So he goes on and he says, verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. I love this because he gives us these, these different building materials. Now, think about it. You've got a foundation laid that's Christ. It's a foundation that could withhold the Empire State Building. This thing is deep and it's wide and it's strong. That's the foundation of Christ. Now God wants you to build in your life upon this. And so you go out there with some, some wood and hay and stubble and you throw up this little lean-to that the big bad wolf comes along and huffs and puffs and he blows it all down, right? Versus building with gold and silver and precious stones. You build this incredible edifice. Now, this is a spiritual metaphor. This is a, uh, a, an example that he's using. But here's what's going to happen. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. You know what it means to be made manifest? It's just like I, Sabrina and I were teasing. Here in just a minute, we're going to tell how good a job she did cooking turkey. Right? How are we going to tell? Because we're going to eat it. Right? And so, and I, I'm just teasing. It's going to be fantastic. I know that it is. But she teased me. I said, thanks for doing it. She said, well, you hadn't tasted it yet. So well, I'm sure it's going to be great. But you know, there's an old saying, the proof is in the pudding. You know, when you taste it, you can tell, oh, this is bad. You know, oh, this is, or, oh my goodness, this is the best thing I ever put in my mouth, right? That's what he says. The day is going to, it's going to be tried. The life you live, you'll have to answer for. That day is coming. Someday, you're going to stand before God. You say, no, no, I'm saved. Oh, yeah, everybody's going to have to answer. Lost people are going to answer at a great white throne. They're going to be hunting for a name in a book that's not there. Saved people are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And God is going to look at your life and he's going to say, you had a choice. You could have walked in light and walked in love and walked in grace and walked in growth and walked in honesty and all those things we talked about and built with gold and built with silver and built with precious stones and built this incredible life for the glory of God or you can build with a wasted life. And his eyes are going to put it through the fire. Look what it says. He says... Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Do you know what? Here's what's really sad. Some people are going to get saved, and then they're going to live for themselves. They're not going to live for Christ. And someday they're going to stand before a great white throne and it's all going to be burned up because they didn't live walking in the good works that God has prepared for them. They weren't salt. They weren't light. They just lived for themselves and they had their get out of hell free card. You say, well, that person can't be saved. It says right there, you can. It says they'll be saved, yet so is by fire. So you can waste the life that God has given you. Please don't do that. Instead, Build with something that can withstand the fire because the fire's coming. You need to know that. You need to understand that. Build with the precious materials that can withstand the fire. Amen? So these two metaphors, we need to be grounded in Christ, rooted in the gospel truth, rooted in the Bible. When you fight this, this worldview battle that you are engaged in right now, and you are engaged in it, and it, it, it's a battle that it has to do with evolution versus creation, and it's huge. It has to do with trusting man versus trusting God. It has to do with marriage and who can be married. It has to do with gender and what is a man and what is a woman? We have a Supreme Court justice who will not answer that question and says she cannot answer that question. At the highest levels of our court, we have this, this kind of battle 
waging right this second. You will be faced with these things. If you are rooted in the Word of God, you will be able to stand and not fall to the temptation to give in to this kind of stuff. But if you're not, if you're not rooted in the Word of God, you're going to be going, well, I just don't know. And since I don't know, then I guess I'll just go with whatever's easiest, just to go along to get along. Listen to me. That's not what Christians do. We do not go along to get along. We stand on the Word of God because we're rooted in it. We are built up in Christ, and we need to live that kind of life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, real quick, let's take a look there. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 talks about this, this grounding. It says there, <clears throat> and are built upon, talking about us as, as uh, well, let's read verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners to God, but are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So all through the New Testament, we have this architectural metaphor that we're actually a building block, a piece in this temple that God is building. So what about being grounded in Christ? What do you do with that? Well, aren't you grateful? Aren't you, aren't you thankful that you have a copy of the Scriptures in a language that you can understand? Do you, do you know how many spoken languages there are on the earth? I think there's like between four and 6,000. There are missionaries that go into places that they actually have to develop a writing system and a phonetic alphabet from an only spoken language so that they can then turn and turn that into a written language, teach the people how to write the language that they speak, so that they can read the Bible. Either that or teach them a totally different language so that they can read the Bible. There are missionaries that have labored their entire lives in a tribe or a village trying to do just that. And I'm so grateful for that. I can't tell you. I, there is not a day goes by I don't get up and I don't say, Lord, this book roots me in Christ. This book grounds me in Christ. Thank you for this book. Thank you for this book. Do you, do you know what it costs to get this book? Have you ever read of William Tyndall? You should read of William Tyndall. You should. You should read of John Wycliffe. You should read of these, these people and what they did to, you know, and guess who they were persecuted by? They were persecuted by the state and they were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church, trying everything they could to keep this book out of the common language. To, ha to have it in English cost people their lives. Why? Because Satan knows if you read this book, you'll be rooted in Christ. He knows if you read this book, you'll be grounded in Christ. He knows that when you read this book, the Spirit will build you up in Christ. And for that, you should be so grateful. I'm so thankful for the Bible. What an incredible gift. But, but that's, not, that's not all of it. So we're growing in Christ. We're grounded in Christ. But number three, we are to be grateful in Christ. Take a look at verse 7. Rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. What a word, abounding. I don't know about you, but how many of y'all have been abounding? By the way, there's two ways to get in a swimming pool. Somebody tell me what they are. Amen, Major. You hear that? That's the only way to get in a swimming pool. Jump in off of the diving board if they have one. If not, cannonball off the side. Somebody said... And then there's, then there's the other way on the steps. Oh, oh, it's cold. Oh, it's cold. Listen, you deal with that cold thing immediately. Just jump in. Amen? You abound into the swimming pool. That's how you deal with it, right? Well, this word abounding in the Greek, guess what it means? It means to super abound. That, that's it. What a word, right? To super abound. It means to be in excess, Right? It means to have enough and to spare. In other words, it means that you and I, as followers of Jesus, we ought to be overabounding, super abounding, more than we need with thanksgiving. There's two things that you cannot mess up. Number one is your manners, and number two is your thanksgiving. You can't do that too much. You can't. It's impossible. 
it's impossible to say thank you too much. It's impossible to say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, to, to, to be polite, right? And so he says abounding in thanksgiving. Well, why, why should we be abounding in thanksgiving? Well, we just looked at all of these things. By the way, Christ is doing all of this stuff in us, right? He's the one who's doing these things. But I want to just take you through a few passages of Scripture and, and show you some of the gifts that he's given us and some of the ways that we should be thankful. First of all, Philippians. So back one book, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. This is the New Testament verse on prayer as far as I'm concerned. I love this one. Be careful for nothing. That's a command. That's an imperative. Stop worrying. Stop fretting about stuff. But, instead of doing that, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. You want to be super abounding in thanksgiving? Be grateful when you pray. What should you pray about? Everything. What should you be thankful for? Everything. You say, no, no, I'm not. There's certain things I'm not thankful for. But wait, there's more. Turn with me back to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 20. Ephesians 5, 20. Giving thanks always. How, how often should we be giving? Always. Always giving thanks. For all things. What? Now wait a minute. How do I give thanks for all things? There are some things that aren't good. Hmm? Don't you love the Bible? Gosh, we were doing so good, and then the preacher went and kicked us in the shins this morning, didn't he? Well, it's not me. I'm just reading here. But giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says. How do you give thanks always for all things? And as you pray, how do you not worry, but, but pray and, and, and ask God for the things you need? And be thankful in all things. Well, I'll give you a verse. Romans chapter 8. You know it. Verse 28. Because it says this. And we know that all things work together for good. So if all things work together for good, then I can be thankful for all things. All things may not be good, but they work together for good. Wendy and I were talking about this this morning. She says... How can we be thankful for Adolf Hitler? The guy wasn't good. I said, well, a couple of things I can think of. Adolf Hitler and what he did paved the way for God to restore the nation of Israel back to the Jewish people. It, that's what it took for the world to sit up and realize, hey, these people, that's their land and we should give it to them. That's one thing. I mean, another thing that it did, and I didn't know this until years later, is it absolutely, completely destroyed the Bushido Code. Gone. Forever. You say, what's that? The samurai. You want to talk about a horrendous, ugly, nasty, those people who flew those planes on death missions, who had their funeral before they left, intending to expend all their bombs and ammunition and then fly their plane into someone's those were samurai those people had adherence to a demonic code called the bushido code and world war ii ended it forever against the law to carry a samurai sword from that day and time on against the law to wear a top knot some people say oh that's not fair listen that was demonic those are just two things that i can think of Here's, here's my point. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't end when you sit back and you look at God's Word and you say, and we know. But the question is, Christian, this is the question for you this morning. You want to live a grateful life. You get with me right here in Romans 8, 28, and let's just, let's just zero in on this for a minute. Do you know this? Do you know that cancer works together for good? Do you know that? Some people would get up right now and fight me over this, saying that I completely misunderstand everything. But that's what it says. Do you know that death is a part of life? And that when that comes about, you know, I, I, 
I was going to vote the other day. I got to tell you this story. This is so funny. Sometimes I'm really good at witnessing and sometimes I'm not. So I'm standing in line to vote. And there's a couple of older guys behind me, and they're talking, you know. I say hello as they walk up, you know, I'm in front of them. Then a younger guy than the older guys, but still kind of a, he's kind of like me, guy. He walks up. Hey, so and so, you know, they all know each other. How you doing? He says, oh, no, I'm all right. It beats the alternative. And I just turned around and looked at him. I said, no, it doesn't. And I was, see, I was baiting. I was baiting. But he didn't take the bait. They all just looked at me like I was crazy, and then they went on talking. What I was wanting was for him to go, what are you talking about? Because I would say, you know, in the book of Philippians, it says, for me to depart and be with Christ is far better. Listen, I, I know that we don't like it when our loved ones come to that place, especially the elderly. But listen to me. To depart and be with Christ is far better. Therefore, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For the lost world, it's hopelessness, it's despair, it's foolishness, it doesn't make sense. But to the Christian, we know these things. Therefore, we can be thankful for these things because that we know that God is working in us an eternal weight of glory. God is doing this for His glory in our lives. A couple more real quick. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. I'm so grateful. I got a new Bible for Christmas, and I just, it just, it doesn't pedal as fast as my old one did. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Listen to what Jesus says. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father. And this, this is interesting to me. This is a place where Jesus thanks the Father. What's he thanking for? I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. And has revealed them unto babes. You know what Jesus said? If you want to be saved, you got to check your PhD at the door and you've got to come to him as a little child. And Jesus says, I thank you, Father, that that's the way it is. I thank you that little children can be saved. And I thank you that God reveals it to us when we humble ourselves and we become like a little child. Isn't that amazing? Jesus thanked the Father for salvation. Look at 1 Timothy with me and chapter 1. A couple verses and then we're done, I promise. First Timothy chapter 1. And take a look there at verse 12. This verse, this verse just, I, I, it just, it just hammers me. I just love this verse every time I read it. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. This is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I thank Christ for putting me in the ministry. I, I thank God every day for that in my own life. But it's not just about guys who are called to be pastors. We're all called to ministry. And so this is something that you can be grateful for. Thank you, Lord, for this ministry that you've given me. This ministry of whatever it is, whatever it is that God has called each one of us to. Well, I got to thinking about this. This is what we're going to close with. You know what Psalm 23, 5 says? That's the shepherd's psalm, right? Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 5 says, My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. You know, when your cup runs over, it means that it's full and then some. Well, I just wrote this in my notes. If my cup runneth over, then I ought to be abounding in thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I don't know about you, but my cup runs over. I hope yours does too. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, your cup's running over. You got, you got, more, you got more than you could ever hope for. You say, well, Roddy, you don't have that ranch over there on the corner after you round the corner there at Eden. Nah, but I have a mansion in heaven. I have, I have a, an eternal reward in heaven that someday I'm going to get to see when I see Jesus. I don't, I don't even know what that means, but I guarantee you it's better than anything on this earth. Amen. And I'm grateful for that. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this day. 
Lord, we are abounding in thanksgiving as we just consider how good you are to us. The fact that we can have this foundation of Christ laid in our life and that we can grow, that we can be grounded, and Lord, that we can be grateful for what you've given us. For all that you've done, we will thank you and for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name.